Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the RBA. Uh, my name is Manisha Kelly, and I am the public programs curator here. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this Reba Plus feature talk uh, with Frida Escobedo tonight. We're excited to be continuing the Reba Plus feature talk series into 2019, showcasing the best in contemporary established and emerging voices in architecture. Leading architects are speaking in events which, which will take place here in London, across the UK, and also internationally in Istanbul, Turkey. Our thanks to Vitra Bathrooms, who are partnering with the RBA by sponsoring this exciting series. We are live streaming to tonight's talk, so um, on the RBA's uh, Facebook page and also uh, the YouTube channel, so a very warm welcome to all of you out there. Um, our thanks uh, again to Richard Bartholomew for being here with us tonight. Uh, we are thrilled to be joined by Frida Escobedo this evening. Frida uh, is an architect based in Mexico City. She is celebrated for dynamic projects that reactivate urban space and most recently designed the Serpentine Pavilion in 2018. Harnessing a subtle interplay of light, water and geometry, her courtyard-based design drew on the domestic architecture of Mexico and British materials. Frida was the youngest architect yet to accept the prestigious invitation and joins an exceptional list of international architects including Zaha Hadid, Oscar Niemeyer, Sana and Peter Zumthor among many others. Frida founded her own practice in 2006 and has since won numerous international awards including the RBA International Fellowship. She has taught extensively in architecture schools including Columbia University, Harvard Graduate Design School and also the Architectural Association here in London. Finally, just a note about social media before we begin. Please uh, feel free to use the hashtag Reba Plus Vitra. After the talk, we'll have an opportunity for questions from the audience, so please do keep that in mind uh, over the next answer, uh, over the next hour. <laughs> so uh, finally, please welcome me uh, in joining Frida to the stage. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm so grateful to be here at RIBA, RIBA, and very honored to be part of the International Fellows, um, something that I didn't expect, but it feels wonderful to be part of this amazing group of people. Um, I'm going to speak about a few of the projects that we've been developing in the office for the past 10 years. Some of them are new, some of them are not, but most of them explain a little bit of what uh, we think behind the architecture and the objects that we do. Um, this is um, a gift I received in 2010 uh, while I was in graduate school. It was given to me by my partner at the time, Max Hooper Schneider, uh, an artist based in LA now, and it's a piece of petrified wood from Arizona. At the time, I was doing a research on how modernist facades in their apparent neutrality um, are capable of expressing social values and desires, or even like certain behaviors, even when there's not a single obvious symbolic component in sight. And this piece of wood really um, embodied very accurately what I was trying to think that was back in my head, and this just precious and beautiful object just put it like into words for me. Um, so I think for me architecture is like that, just like in this mixture between being um, an object that explains human behavior or certain forces that are hidden and how certain patterns and materials such as wood or other forms of minerals are informed both for their own formation and conditions under which this process took place. Um, in a similar fashion, I think the architectural object develops via accretion and erosion uh, by inhabitation, appropriation, exchange, and agency, just like in this beautiful drawing by Robert Smithson, A Heap of Language, where he brilliantly explains um, the way words are built but also eroded and translated every time. So the project I was working on when I received that beautiful gift was um, based on these Anonymous building, it's, it's a relatively um, usual building in Mexico City, located in Colonia Juarez, a neighborhood where I grew up in. Uh, it's one of the many offices, buildings in Mexico City that look just like that, a perfect grid, um, you know, like simple glass and, and, stained uh, and steel structure. 
Um, and they seem to possess nothing in particular, but yet it always caught my attention when I was walking by. It has, kind of has like these uh, fascination that I have with ruins, even though it's not a ruin, it was a lived building. Um, you can see in the window that some of the processes of construction in Mexican modernism um, kind of allude to European or North American modernism, but they're handmade. So that was the first fascination. Like this is an object that when you get closer, you actually realize that the structure is handmade as opposed to having industrial processes. But what really caught my attention uh, was that it was not the process of erosion that it was undergoing being so run down, um, but it seemed to almost gain the passage of time, like to accumulate the signs of time. Its materiality also make it hard to define the limits between the facade and the building. As you go closer, um, you could see how this process of accumulation happened behind these window panes that were so transparent and apparently neutral. Um, the glass curtain almost remained untouched, but um, the facade appeared to be like receding and expanding like a shoreline somehow, like between construction and decay. The fact that the building had remained so intact uh, and, and at the same time changing so much I, w I think it was the reason why I find it so fascinating to, to see and why I decided to do like a bigger research on that. Uh, behind the, fa the glass facade you can read like no, not only like the needs for more space or shade or even announcing yourself to the public like this lawyer on the, on the corner, uh, but also you can read like the half-hidden narratives behind the, the life of the people who were inhabiting this building and almost uh, aspirations like having a French window on, 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 a, on a modernist building, which I thought was like really nice. And there was only one time when I saw someone peeking out of the window and it was like this uh, old lady with her white hair and she was just like very properly sitting on that window pretending to be in this little chateau inside the, the, the modernist building. So to me, every curtain, every, every drywall addition, uh, every adaptation, every tape on the window um, reveal this facade's nature, one that is divided across identity and representation. Um, it's, it's very similar to this idea of the mask. What this building reminded me is that the, the facade actually materializes character, whether, whether it is intended for that purpose or not. And they perform their, their function as the same way we perform our public face, very much like this idea of the facade or the face. Um, in the case of Mexican character, Octavio Paz, one of our most prominent poets, one pointed out that we perform our face as simultaneously on one hand a shield, a wall, and on the other a symbol cover surface, a hieroglyph. The facade has an etymological origin in fascia uh, that points out to the instrumentality of the public face of the building, but also you can relate that route to the etymology of facere, to do. So the building facade is also what you do with your face. Uh, this mechanism of construction of identity, I think, is uh, evident in many other buildings in Mexico uh, where we show um, that towards our race for development, our past became the ballast that somehow stood between us and the idea of progress. Uh, so we conveniently decided to sweep it under this idea of um, modernity and the hegemonic discourse, uh, flattening it into this a single image that uh, the, the national identity was. No? Like this is an image of Tlatelolco with the Plaza de las Tres Culturas where you see the three layers of Mexican history and we were trying to emulate this modernist movement right here with buildings all over the city. So development had produced this oxymoronic effect uh, of what the word means, of what the word development means. Instead of unfolding and opening out, it created this inwardness as an illusionary form of liberation. Um, the building that we are seeing here, the, the previous one, uh, is an example of this type of ubiquitous but anonymous modernist building in wh where we can see in this contradicting fashion that it's concealed by an apparent neutrality, but it's actually showing us the genesis uh, that it, that it be, became, that this process of becoming. 
uh, just like the rings on a tree or like some forms of mineral that are slowly, uh, you know, like compressing and expanding over time to create these patterns. So these underlying structures are very present throughout Mexican history. You can see these forms. This is uh, Museo de la Ciudad de Mexico, where you can actually see how the ancient city is part and the current present of uh, this colonial building. And the same way, um, you can see how the Templo Mayor, the main temple, was built every few years again and again in this process of accretion. And it's not about denying uh, the past, but also like building on top of that is concealing and revealing at the same time. So it, it in a way does not become a dead subsoil, but a rich fertile ground for new expressions. And it is evident also in even forms of uh, self-building like these houses where you can actually see the family structure and the time accretion that is happening slowly in layers and the forms of expression that even reveal like of course political preferences but also religious ones and of course why not uh, three household heads were making the decisions in the single house to decide the color of these uh, this uh, unit so you can actually read a family story through just reading the facade so um, for this project, it was crucial to recognize that the curtain wall was uh, this zone of liminal exchange and that the transparent surface uh, could parallel the threshold between face and mask, as I was saying. Um, so it was important to photograph each one of the strata of, of, the, of the windows. Um, the images were decoded almost like an historiographic approach, like very scientific. Um, so you could really see all the differences and the repetitions, the relationships through transparency, uh, the adaptations, the way people were communicating with each other, the neighbors were communicating. They, they, they came up with the same solutions for water filtrations, for example, from one floor to the other. Um, again, the relationship to transparency. And it was first presented at um, Liga, this space dedicated to architecture and design in Mexico City. That was the first iteration. It was a small installation. Liga is a small gallery, but one that allows architects to really express what their thoughts are just behind the work, not just present their current work, but also the ideas behind it. And that's why I appreciate uh, a lot that they invited me. And for the second part, um, well, it had like a, a, a second life. And many years after, a friend of mine called me and said, like, you know what, this, this building is for sale. You should go check it out and maybe see what, what you can do with the windows. You should at least see what's inside. Um, it was heavily damaged by the earthquake of September 2017. Um, so I was a little bit nervous to come in, but I did. Um, and what I, what I saw was like these remains again of... Um, Life, even if it was an empty building, you could see uh, some of the marks, that the, the presence of the people living there. Um, even some strange things like um, these uh, flying uh, simulator inside one of the rooms. I was just crossing my fingers that no pilot ever had uh, learned how to fly in that that I was flying to. Um, and I was able to get a hold of the of the windows, almost thirty percent of the windows of the of the building, and um, the rest were um, well. What we tried to do was like to acquire them, but also we substituted it with clear glass uh, for for the building. That that was the the deal with the owner. Um, they were very carefully transported and preserved, and they are currently uh, in an exhibition called Architecture Effects in the Guggenheim Bilbao Museum. Uh, it's an exhibition curated by Troy Conrad and Manuel Sirauki. Uh, and the idea behind the exhibition is to show that architecture is in a state of constant relocation. So I thought it was like a really good match, not just to see uh, that architecture can look towards the future in terms of technology, but also like maybe look at the past and maybe look at the remains of, of the lived environment, of what duration and social life is. And um, this can become like a register of it. When you think about it, they become like these very beautiful abstract paintings. But when you look closer, you can really see the traces of life happening behind them. Uh, these are some of the images of the exhibition. And this is the space with um, some, of, some of the artists also.
And that, that idea of social life being presented or being manifested in space, I think, started uh, maybe one year earlier with this project at Museo, uh, Museo Leco, uh, a, museo, um, a museum sorry, that uh, has a very strong personality, and it was quite a challenge. Uh, it's a beautiful building uh, designed in 1953 by sculptor Matthias Geritz, a Mexican artist of German origin. And while I was thinking about the proposal, it was quite a challenge because the, the courtyard is so strong and it has like this beautiful geometry to it and has like such strong personality that it was really hard to compete with these objects that had inhabited it before. So we were thinking more about a surface and less of an object. And while I was doing this competition, I came across an interview of writer um, Brenda Lozano and in that interview, she said that her work as a writer was very similar to that of a bricklayer, just putting one word right next to the other until you can pre the phrase and then you build the text. So thinking about that, I thought like, well, maybe if literature is so similar to the work of a bricklayer, maybe the role of the architect could also be similar to um, the one that a concrete poet does, uh, following like this idea of Ferreira Gullar of doing the maximum expression through a minimum of words. And then I started looking in, in this way to, to find like the single word that could give a maximum expression. And of course, the cinder block came to mind. Uh, it's a piece that you can see very often in Mexican self-constructor architecture. And as you can see, it provides, uh, even though it's very modular and industrially produced, and it's just a cube, it gives way to a multitude of expressions from screens right here to staircases to balconies to different geometries. So to me, it was a perfect single word to use. And the, this idea of repeating a single object in space uh, also reminded me a lot about Agnes Martin work um, in these beautiful drawings. What she was doing is creating these perfect grids that revealed certain nuances uh, when the pencil starts getting blunt or when the hand starts getting tired or the texture of the paper. Um, so all of this is revealed through this idea of constant repetition. So. Um, the proposal was just to do this very, um, you know, simple uh, pattern of, of bricks that we could program in different ways. One was the, the program that the museum needed, but of course, uh, there was also this layer of people moving around the bricks that were encouraged to do so. So we, for the programming part of the museum, we did a forum, a sitting space, a bar, and so on. But then um, just, people moving pieces around would actually change the syntaxis of what the architectural text could be. Um, these are a couple of girls moving the pieces around in space. Um, when, when I show this outside Mexico, people tell me like, but this is a big liability. And I assure you, Mexican kids are very courageous and very responsible, so nothing happened ever. Um, and as you can see, they were building their small cities and just playing around and building their own world. And to me, what was important was to show that these two layers could be coexisting and actually informing each other, just like the city does. Like the, what we plan as architects and urbanists or designers is actually just probably half or not even half of what is going on in the built environment. Uh, some other artists were also invited to participate in the space, like Pia Camille and her group uh, El Resplandor. Uh, they were trying to build an igloo. We convinced them that it was impossible to do it with a, you know, with a brick. <laughs> so they decided to do just like this round piece. Um, they were performing. And one of the other components uh, that was really important for the pavilion was that once the public program was over, people were also encouraged to take some of the bricks home. So you could either take one block if you just wanted to have a souvenir, or maybe like take 10 and finish your bookshelf, or take 200 and finish your room, or uh, as, as it happened, if you were a developer, you would take all of them and just use them to, to build an apartment building, which didn't come as a surprise. Uh, but at the end, we were very happy uh, that all the blocks came back to the city and that they, like, they actually came back to where they started in this narrative. Um, other project that I think starts showing how we want to make these invisible things visible is 
the Civic Stage, uh, a project uh, where uh, Jose Esparza Choncui, um, a curator uh, and critic that is now uh, the director of Storefront in New York, uh, invited me to do for the Lisbon Triennial for the new public's program. And the commission was to rethink about the podium, like this idea of people talking on a stage like this and just being like high up and then like a very passive audience and this relationship which is not very symmetrical. So we were uh, just trying to understand what the central ideas behind it were, the, behind the public program, and also what we'd resonated um, in terms of what we thought was a, was a stage. Uh, of course, we thought the, the public space should be more democratic, and of course, many voices were rising at the time. Um, so we thought that the circle was a perfect form to just give shape to this uh, new stage. Uh, it has no hierarchy, it has uh, no corners, there is no up and down. Um, and what we decided to do was also to do, uh, it's fairly visible, maybe we can turn the lights a little bit down so we can see better, but um, the idea is to have a circle with a faceted surface uh, that you can actually use as a seesaw. So it actually balances when people are coming into the space. So actually just the voice of the speaker is as high as the people who are listening to them. That was the main idea. And of course we could have like some more playful iterations of like this, this balancing act where the, uh, actually the speaker will be in disadvantage. Um, and also the other condition was that it should be able to present Andres Jaque, uh, this fantastic architect from Madrid, uh, his play Superpowers of Ten. If you haven't seen it, please look for it. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. And what we tried to do there is to invert the relationship of the stage and the audience again by just putting a, a huge curtain around it. So in a way, what it will do would be to reframe uh, the stage. So you would be inside and the, the, the background would actually be the city. So you would be looking at the city uh, with tourists' eyes, but just reframing it. And a very interesting happened um, when we were when we were doing this because then actually the people from the city became the actors themselves. I'm going to show you in a, in a second those those images. Um, the selection of the plaza was also really difficult. Um, Lisbon is a beautiful city with wonderful plazas, but they have a very strong symmetry and a very strong relationship to the buildings around them, usually either a civic building or a religious building. Uh, so we were trying like very hard to find the perfect one and they, they seem to be like so focused already and so perfect in their geometry that we came up um, to this plaza, Rocio, and we noticed that, well, maybe we could put it here. This is the ventilation for the subway station. And we thought maybe we can do a balancing act right here by putting the civic stage here. Um, but then we noticed this plaza, Figueiras. And no one had talked about us about that plaza before. And we were really curious why. And people just said, like, no, it's Figueiras. It's not really a public space. It's more like a transit space. It's a... It's a transportation hub. You have the taxis, you have the, the subway station, you have a parking space, and then you have King John's first equestrian, the, the first equestrian statue, which, which is right here, which was off center. And we thought like, well, this is really strange. It's like King John is giving the back to the, to the public space and he is like bored of seeing the, the plaza and he just wants to see through the street into the river. So we thought like, this is perfect, we should use this. So we put the, the civic stage uh, right behind him. And this is the Mexican tortilla in uh, Lisbon. Um, we, we actually fabricated um, the structure in Mexico. As you can see, like this also became, at that moment, this exercise on different economies. Even though uh, Lisbon is one of the places where it's more affordable to build in Europe, it was way more affordable to build it in Mexico City and then to ship it overseas. So that was a lesson to us as well. So the, play, the, the, the pieces were assembled uh, in Lisbon and a few days later we were having this opening for the Lisbon Triennial. Uh, this is one of the events. Um, there's uh, Beatrice Galile, Jose Espasa right there. 
And we had many events. Um, the, the major act where all the candidates for a major of the city of Lisbon came and had like this round table discussion, which, which we thought was fantastic. And then of course, um, the opening night for Superpowers of 10. And it was a really nice moment. All of these are architects, even though they're not dressed in black. Uh, but we were all right there in this podium and people just started to look at us like we were like very strange creatures, which we are, but um, they were like, why, why are they just gathered there sitting and what's going to happen? And of course, Andres just used the city lights and some, you know, like manually like uh, carried lamps. Um, and this was, the, this was the effect, you know, the curtains were slowly opening. So there was this double layer of audience. One was us, the architects, but then people just peeking through the windows, slowly coming to the balconies, and of course passersby. And this mix of just being in the space and being an actor became the same thing. So we thought it was quite successful that, that evening. Um, other, other forms of uh, interaction with the public spaces ha have happened with uh, special commissions, like the one we did for La Tallera, a public museum in Mexico City. This was also done in 2010, and this was um, the original weekend house for David Alfaro Siqueiros, one of our most prominent muralists in Mexico. Uh, he proclaimed himself as a communist, but he had a weekend house with a swimming pool, so we thought that was very convenient. Uh, and when he died, he decided to leave his house to uh, the, the government for, for it to be used as a cultural and a production space. That's why he changed the, the gender to La Tallera. He, it was about giving birth to uh, other, other forms of creation. So this was the original condition of the building when we found it. It was very run down and um, the condition originally was that there was this plaza in front of this courtyard that he used to paint one of his big murals, well, several of his murals. So you can see here the relationship with the plaza, the contained courtyard, and it's a, a residential area basically. So this is what we found when, when we first came in. This, two gigantic murals just crammed in the little courtyard. And to me, this was, well, Siqueiros was all about public art and how to make this accessible for everyone. So it makes no sense at all to have these two murals facing each other inside this tiny courtyard. So the idea was just to rotate them. Again, we cannot see that very clearly. Maybe we can turn the lights a little bit so we can see this more. Just maybe like the front ones. I don't know if that's possible. Okay. <laughs> so basically, this was the idea, no? Like to, to change the murals. And you can see here the original building and then the plaza um, opening to this courtyard. So it was an operation almost of nip and tuck, no? Like this, these are the two murals. And then you can see the operation was actually. Um, erasing more than designing, which was one of the risks that we were uh, having uh, while we were doing the competition. We were afraid that we might lose just because we were giving this space to the public space, but actually that was the thing that got us in <laughs> as, as the winners of the, of the competition. And we were thinking a lot about like these Lija Pape Bichos or critters, you know, these unfolding things that when you actually activate one piece, the rest are activated. So that was certainly the idea behind just shifting a wall and then opening the space so you could have different programs. You can see here, this is, this is weird. Uh, but then you can see that all the spaces that are in white are actually um, the, the previous or the, the, the original building and then everything that was built on top was actually uh, the, the raw material. So you could see the difference between old and new very easily. Uh, this is the cafeteria. Uh, this is behind the murals. So you can see the relationship with the plaza and how they don't interfere with the public space. So even though they're open to the plaza, they don't, they're not in the front uh, stage. 
anymore. They have like these little courtyards sunken in because we have a slope that is working uh, in our advantage. So the entrance to uh, the museum is actually through this very slight slope and that allows to create this little pockets of activity for both the bookshop and the cafeteria. Uh, this was the original condition of one of the sides of the building. As you can see, this building was built in many phases. So what we tried to do was just to create this uh, more institutional feel that was required in the competition uh, by having this uh, thin screen covering all these pieces that were put together over time. So it became like this transparent veil that actually revealed a little bit of the, of the accretion of time and of course allowed the sun and the light to come in inside. Um, all the trees of the property were preserved. So um, Cuernavaca is this very lucky city that has a very privileged climate. So um, most of the year you can have an open uh, window and it's really warm and, and, and the breeze is flowing. So this opportunity of just creating this shaded space was there. And it's very usual in Mexico to use this kind of uh, screen walls to just allow the breeze to come in. This was the final result. You can see here how the plaza opened to these two murals and how the slope actually takes you. It almost forces a perspective uh, to take you to the entrance of the museum. And even when the museum is closed, you have the opportunity to have these other programs such as the cafeteria right here or the library, which is right here on, on the other side. Um, this is the opening day, but we were very happy when, when this happened. Uh, usually when you design a house or a private building, you have a client and it's like, I always say, like it's writing a letter to someone or you have a correspondence. You hear back from these people and they inform you. But when you're designing a public space, it's like playing music. You don't know if they're going to like it or not. But when people are having their... Uh, wedding photograph taken in this space, you know that they're connecting with it because it, it's going to end up in their family album, uh, in their living room, or in their Instagram now. But um, we were extra happy when this happened. Um, this is just the banda, and they used uh, La Tallera as a backdrop, and just like having this theater happening in front of the of La Tallera, we, we thought that that was very successful and they were even wearing like matching vests so it was like yes we, we, we did it <laughs> um, and I think that led to this project that many of you have seen uh, here in London um, it's the Serpentine Pavilion and um, some of you know it but it was quite a surprise um, I didn't expect it uh, I've, I've seen and I followed the Serpentine Pavilion for many years so uh, when we received the invitation, I thought it was just spam. I said invitation, Serpentine Gallery. So I sent it to my spam folder thinking, it was, well, it's just a newsletter or something. And then one week later, I received a second email saying, like, did you receive your previous email? So I pulled it out and it was like, damn, this is an invitation to design the Serpentine Pavilion. So we, we had lost a week. Uh, the people at the office were killing me, but um, we had to rush and... The first thing that we had to do was just to see what all the proposals were about. We were, you know, trying to find a brilliant idea and then we decided to stop and just think about like what we think and how we do it at the office and that was our approach. And the first thing is like, well, what can a pavilion tell us about temporality and about space and about time? And while doing so, um, I remember my three weeks here at the Architectural Association um, when we were thinking about London time and the Greenwich Meridian Line. And we started then thinking about the ways we as humans have been measuring and understanding time, just like the Jeffersonian grid or, again, the, the, the parallels uh, in the world, this is a, an abstract way of measuring uh, space, time, but also relationships and exchange. And of course, as you know, the Royal Observatory is a few miles away from here in Greenwich. Um, and to me, this was a very fascinating idea because it's 
very recent that we understand the time as we do now, like before that, even just looking at this clock, which is 24 hours, is very bizarre. You, you cannot grasp the idea of time within this object as we do with stopwatches or now with our phones. Um, so that was the initial point of departure for the pavilion. We were tracing this line at the Greenwich Meridian and then also understanding the basic uh, geometry of what we could define as a courtyard space because that's what we know how to do in Mexico. We, we know how to do a courtyard, we know how to use breeze, we know how to use the wind. And um, we, we kind of relate better in this enclosed spaces. We feel protected and that's what we wanted to create. So uh, we had this line that's crossing uh, the, the courtyard that is aligned to the Greenwich Meridian in such a way that we have a large covered area. Initially, we wanted to have a more open area, but um, Julie Burnell from the Serpentine Galleries insisted that the, the British summer is not as nice as the Mexican summer, so we needed to have more roofed space, and we follow her lead. And this is uh, the result. We have an, an opening here, and the rest is covered. Um, and we wanted to use something very simple, a very simple material, and we decided to go for something that, again, was modular, was easy to find, was not, like the, the design did not depend on the object. It was the other way around. You could weave something with a very simple material, almost like you would weave a tapestry, you know, just like going back and forth, and then it would create some kind of visual interest. Um, so this is, a, this is a pavilion, and as you can see, it has these layers of transparency that allow you to see the landscape, but as you move through the space, these walls become oblique, and then you kind of are enclosed in this opaque object that really embraces you. Uh, this is the line that is aligned with the meridian, and as you can see, this, there's this positive and negative effect uh, highlighted by the idea of reflection. We had a very shallow pool that would reflect not only the sky but also the wall, and then this curved uh, ceiling that would somehow expand uh, the space that was already compressed by this, by this roof, and that would deform the space um, in such a way that it would be like a little bit hard to understand the space and you would have to navigate through it. This was a beautiful moment on the summer solstice where you can see that actually you could see the flow and the, the movement also of the sun as it aligned perfectly uh, at noon and you can see that the shade just drop in this line, this virtual line that measures how we exchange goods and how we move through time and space. And this kid just like standing right there in the meridian. Um, um, some of the details is like detaching the roof and making this reflection. And of course, uh, all the programs that the Serpentine Galleries uh, did were aligned not only to this idea of connecting with uh, the notion of mondialité that uh, Hans Ulrich talks talk so much about, but also with the idea of uh, colonization and territory. For example, uh, Ghetto Gastro and the Radical Kitchen programs, or uh, Zinzi Minot uh, talking about sugar and how that actually colonizes our world and how we behave around these products. Uh, so we thought it was really successful just to propose an idea that was quite abstract and that was actually invisible and that could create this conversation about how we actually territorialize the, the world. These are some images of the, of the park nights too. And then we were trying to register what the pavilion was uh, last, last summer and most of the journalists would approach us and say like, tell me what is the picture of the Serpentine Pavilion and we were having such a hard time doing that because it's not a pavilion that you can see as an object uh, for good and bad. These are some of the images that people have been posting on Instagram. Uh, and as you can see, none of them are the same. Uh, we're in an era where um, people use architecture very much as a wallpaper, as a backdrop for their Instagram stories. So we were very happy when this uh, note appeared uh, from uh, this guy who was saying that it was bloody difficult to photograph. Uh, so we were thrilled that he wrote that. And it's like, yes, this is, this is what we want to have um, 
we just want to have like this shared experience of creating something and it's more about the conversation at the network that you create rather than the actual object itself. Um, so yes, maybe this is the general photograph, but if you see it, that's not the experience of the Serpentine Pavilion. So after the exhaustion that followed the, the whirlwind of uh, the Serpentine Pavilion, uh, we're trying to slowly go back to the normal rhythm of life. And I will, I will need to really lower the lights here because I, I think this, this is not gonna be seen if, if you don't have like a dark, sorry about that. Um, but one of the, the things that we are talking about constantly in the studio is how to make visible certain dynamics or flows or movements that seems to be invisible, but we, we have every day. And domestic spaces are, of course, central in many architecture offices, and private houses provide a window not only to understand a specific client, as I was saying, but also to understand certain forms of domination that happen within a space, especially those related to gender, class, and race. And I assure you that this is a coincidence, but um, when the Roma movie came out, we had been working on this research for a year, so we were like really surprised that this form of um, you know, manifestation was very present, and I think it's very relevant right now to talk of these power relationships within the domestic space, especially being a woman. So uh, we've been working uh, recently with the III, or Instituto de Investigaciones Independientes, a collaborative platform led by Luciano Concheiro and Javier Nueno, uh, that aims to present investigation and study uh, with new artists and um, architects as me. And we are participating in the first number of news. Um, this, this is their first publication. And the search, the, the research that we're developing is titled Domestic Orbits. Um, and for that, uh, Alejandro Hernandez Galvez wrote this wonderful prologue for it. And in it, he describes how Alexander Klein's text, Preparation of Plants and Configuration of Spaces in Small Houses and New Evaluation Models. Uh, describe how houses should be conceived in such a way that it is actively and organically related to the current living conditions and the cultural needs uh, while satisfying the needs for maximum economy and simplicity. Um, after this uh, text, he concludes that the house built so far uh, did not satisfy the spiritual needs of the owners of the houses. And as you can see, he makes this analysis of circulation and lived space. Um, uh, a few years later, in her book, Modern Housing, uh, Catherine Bauer described how Klein had, stu had studied these everyday movements and requirements for families, and that these floor plans almost represented very precisely, and like no one else, this complete rationalization of inhabitable space produced uh, so far. Uh, Bauer reproduced one of the Klein's floor plans in this diagram entitled Functional Housing for Frictionless Living. Um, a few years later, in 78, Robin Evans published Figures, Doors, and Passages, where he describes Klein's frictionless living as this hidden metaphor of the, all the accidental encounters that cause friction and therefore the, the threat to human relationships. Um, but to me, this, this, this threat to relationships has also to do with uh, domesticity and caretaking and, of course, housework and unpaid labor. Um, when you think about it, corridors appear uh, in this moment of history where service needs to be hidden also from view. This is a coincidence, but it's nothing to, um, you know, hide. Uh, this is something that should be manifested in space and slowly we've been creating these mechanisms of erasure that are growing bigger and bigger each day. Um, so for the first case study uh, that Luciano and I discussed three years ago, um, we, we started talking about Casa Barragan, uh, Casa Estudio Luis Barragan. 
as, as uh, you, you probably know very well this house and as a student I visited this space several times um, and a few years later we did a couple of exhibition designs uh, for, for this space now that it's run by Estancia FEMSA one for the Dada exhibition and for the Marius Desai exhibition and I, while, while I was working in there I started realizing a series of behaviors that I hadn't been aware before um, so as you may know, this, this house is um, part of the World uh, Heritage by UNESCO. Um, it was proclaimed like that after um, Barragan's death in 88. And uh, the preservation work is very perfect and they keep the, the house as intact as when he was living there. There's this you know, effort to maintain it just as the architect wanted to, it to be. But this work of preservation for me like started raising a few questions and later I found out that the, there is a house within the house of Barragan um, and in this house uh, the housekeeper, the original housekeeper that lived with Barragan still lives. Um, apparently there is this clause included in Barragan's will to allow her to live uh, there until she pass, uh, passes away. So what can be seen as a very generous gesture of the architect um, reveals at the same time that a room of one's own, as Wolf would say, is highly problematic for domestic workers. The space they live in is never truly theirs. They're, they never own this home and the degree of intimacy and privacy that they're allowed is seen almost as a concession of the actual owners. And in the end, it establishes a radical form of expropriation that can continue even when the patron is long gone, as the case of Barragan. So um, this is a piece, a piece by Daniel Ortiz, uh, comparing just like the, the sizes of the rooms. This is a main room, a regular room, and then the domestic uh, service quarters areas rooms. So you can see like it's almost a fourth of the of the size. And for Silvia Federici, the, um, what this reveals is that domestic work implies are organizing the territory as a social space structured for production. And this is very evident in the case of Barragan. As long as you're producing something, as you're maintaining something, then you have the right to live in a specific space. Um, in this case, the servir quarters or cuarto de servicio could be understood as a minimal unit or self of this form of organization. So here you can see the ground floor of Casa Barragan. And usually what you do is you enter through this door. And what you don't see is the section of the house, uh, which is the server's quarters areas and the kitchen. And the same happens in the several floors that follow, you know, as in many other bourgeois houses, uh, where you have the staircase and then you have like these hidden areas and to me it was really fascinating just to start imagining um, with Barragan design uh, the same you know details is it the same flooring is it the same finish in the bathroom this is the house of Barragan that has never been published and I really want to see it but because it has this clause where it's in this uh, liminal zone between being a private property and a museum it's impossible to see it right now so I'm really fascinated by that idea of preservation and um, legacy that the architects give. A second case study is uh, Mario Pani's housing block in Reforma Avenue, uh, built in 1959. Um, just one year before he did this building, Barragan built uh, almost exactly the same uh, building right in front of uh, across the street. And it was the first condominium in Mexico City, which actually changed the idea of property and, um, and land in Mexico City. And the way um, the floor plans are represented, especially in housing, uh, in, in books dedicated to housing, is this. Um, you can see the, the apartments, but they're missing like a big part of the project, which is this. They are usually not represented like this. And the actual floor plan is all the way to here. And while there are some office spaces in the first floor and some uh, retail spaces in the ground floor, what is actually interesting is this block here because these are the service quarters. So even when you're doing um, a housing book, you're not considering a big part of the inhabitants of that building. Um, and the hidden relationship behind them, like for example, how technology actually connected these spaces while they were disconnected. It was no longer the silver bell on the table, but also like just the, you know, the phone maybe, or 
technology as the elevator that would take you down a few floors into the basement and into the parking space to bring you to this tiny staircase that is actually the entrance, the formal entrance to this second building that is nested also inside a Panis building. So these two worlds uh, seem to be like these bubbles that never connect to each other, but they're connected and dependent to each other. And that's uh, what we're fascinated about, like these, these little objects that create space in, in different ways. And the, the tactics that people use to get some um, privacy and some, some ways of comfort and practical adjustments uh, that need to be made, like this water heater behind this uh, screen that now is presenting in this inner facade that is uh, facing the courtyard. Uh, other, uh, other patterns are present in more contemporary forms of architecture, and of course it's prevalent in many of the forms of architecture that we do every day, and I think it's just something that we need to think about, um, especially in, in buildings where there is this apparent honesty about what's happening inside with this enclosure of glass just being presented as like a way to perform into the public face. Um, these areas still hide um, beneath the walls. As you can see here, uh, the core of the building not only has the elevators and their staircases, but these rooms that function almost as operational as um, the vertical circulations and the, the ducts uh, for water, electricity, and so on. So this idea of understanding um, the flow uh, not just of, of water and electricity itself, but also like the people circulating within the building is what J.B. Harley describes as cartographic silence. So what we're trying to do now is just mapping these buildings. These are just three of the cases that we're studying and we're expanding it to understanding how this affects also the urban space and not just the cell itself, the, 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 the building and trying to find a way to, to represent it um, so we can make these invisibilities a little bit more visible. And um, another project that we are working on currently, we recently finished it, is Estaciones, um, a, a project that has to do with public uh, space, but mostly with public art. Um, it was presented originally in the Orleans Biennial in France, uh, curated by Luca Garofalo and Abdel Kader Damani. Um, and the term estación uh, or can be translated both as station but also season. And to me that was important because it's not only a landmark but also like this cycle that repeats itself uh, in a circular way almost. Um, these are stills from the movie Los Olvidados by Luis Buñuel. And in it, he impeccably portrays, in my opinion, uh, the post-revolutionary Mexico. Um, at this time, there, it, Mexico was uh, a country in the making. He had to come up with an identity that was not clearly defined. At that point, you can see the skyscraper being built here, but also like the reality behind it. And the conflict was, in the end, uh, on one hand, that he that we wanted to project an image of development and sophistication, uh, but simultaneously we had to um, show a Mexico that had to overcome social injustice and the hegemony that landholders and foreigners had over the country's economy. Um, it was under this context of modernity that um, we had to reconcile progress and tradition and to work uh, in a way to, to, to create this effective tool for the country's transformation. Um, it's important to consider the political factor in this equation. The revolutionary mo movement that started in 1910 was composed of many different fractions that had very, very different political agendas. And the triumph of um, the revolution in 1917 did not really guaranteed this position of democracy and peaceful transition into it. So the following period consisted of this series of anarchic revolts that most of the times culminated with the killing of one of the elected candidates in turn of the caudillos. Um, this systematic elimination of the head of state as a presidential figure um, was neither democratic nor self-destructive and the only way to guarantee its own survival, the group in power 
established two measures that broke the cycle of violence and death. It was the non-re-election and the creation of Partido, Revolu Partido Nacional Revolucionario, what later became PRI or Partido Revolucionario Institucional, which was in power for 70 years, actually 72. So for, this, for the next 72, the figure of the president and the party became indivisible. The party was dedicated to preserve political control, uh, not only through physical repression, but also deploying like very subtle mechanisms of manipulation. And while it remained loyal to the president in turn, it was known that it was only going to be for a specific period. Um, this is a um, fraction of a piece of, of a fragment of a piece of uh, Tercer Un Quinto, a collective artist group uh, based in Mexico City. And what they present is these walls that are painted over and over again with pro political propaganda. And they use like a very thin coat of paint to save money. So you can see like almost like this watercolor where all the names start like layering on top of each other. It's a really beautiful piece because then you can really understand this kind of discontinuity and continuity. So in other words, um, it was Pri's mission or the party's mission to guarantee the stability that was necessary for progress to flourish and therefore establishing a new vision for the new country, for the new nation. And for this purpose, it was necessary that all the institutions reflected the party's vision and no one did it better than Pedro Ramirez Vázquez. Pedro Ramirez Vázquez was an architect that did not define himself as an architect who had an identifiable style, which very conveniently, like, suited the party's interest. In, in my opinion, he was like not much about a style as he was about strategy, as we can see him like talking to the, to the militaries. Um, it was the, the, the late 50s and late 60s, and then things started not being as happy as they seemed and as um, optimistic as they, as they were actually presented. By the time Gustavo de Azordaz came to power, the vision of modernity and progress endorsed by the state behind to tarnish uh, behind the political crisis that was almost impossible to deny. So the tension produced by the sharp social contrast um, eventually led to the, um, ter the, the terrible um, Tatelolco massacre where thousands of students uh, died and many were disappeared. Um, simultaneously in 68, just 10 days after the massacre, we had the opening for the Olympic Games. Um, it was a very um, contrasted moment where we had Pedro Ramirez Vasquez as the general director of the Olympic Games. There has, no, there has not been another architect that directs the Olympic Games, so you can really read the power that this man had and how the state really used him to produce this idea of what national identity is. You're probably very familiar with this Mexico 68 logo. Uh, so Pedro Ramirez Vasquez had this vision of recovering not only like the original sports spirit of uh, the Olympic Games, but also to recover the cultural Olympics. Um, and for that purpose, he did a series of events that would be parallel to the games. Uh, one of them was Ruta de la Amistad, a public sculpture project that was installed along the newly inaugurated uh, Periférico. Um, and the colorful and monumental sculptures conveniently portrayed us as a cosmopolitan and, and modern nation without having to appeal to either an explicit nationalism or provincial aesthetic. It was actually a requirement to be abstract, monumental, and colorful. Um, and while we were doing some research on Ruta de la Amistad, uh, we found a series of photographs in a contact sheet, very small. I didn't even recognize these, these <coughs> monuments at the beginning because I grew up in this uh, side of the city and I never realized how fragile they were. They, they were just these very thin uh, structures covered by an even thinner veneer of concrete. And these photographs to me were fascinating because they show the scaffold and the structure just becoming undistinguishable, almost like revealing the, you know, the need of like depending on the precariousness of, of the scaffold more than in the structure. And also like this sign of Presidente right here, which I thought was really a good coincidence. Um, 
So the proposal for the Estaciones project um, aimed really to reveal this duality, this scenographic moment um, that were presented as, as you bear down the, the sculptures. These hollow structures actually um, exposed uh, the construction process of the sculptures, but also pointed out the intrinsic politics behind uh, this, their incompleteness. They were almost like ruins in reverse. Um, and as you can see here in this image, um, they had something to, to do almost with this idea of the Tatlin Tower and um, this monument that for Svetlana Boy materializes not only many and implicit and explicit meanings of the word revolution, uh, but also this, this idea of repetition and rotation. No? When, when we think about the word revolution, we always think about it as a break in, in the history, but it actually is a very recent um, signifier of the word. Uh, previously, the idea of revolution was more about rotation and repetition and this constant flow of things coming back and forth. So to me, it was a little bit more of that. So these are all the images that we were um, gathering. Uh, Alexander Calder participated in the project. Um, they kind of materialized this, this moment of construction, but also a ruination of a very precise political moment. As you can see, Villa Olimpica was being built, again, no, with this reminiscent of uh, the pre-colonial architecture. And it was this moment of re recapitulation, almost of Mexican character. So the first iteration we did for the project was around a uh, number nine sculpture, a uh, sculpture designed by American sculptor Todd Williams. Uh, was one of the most colorful sculptures in, in, the, in the Ruta de la Amistad. And what we did was just trying to work around these images and they were presented um, afterwards in Arthur Ross Gallery at Columbia University, a uh, uh, scaled model for that. And then this series of photographs just representing this moment of construction and destruction along with some um, documental um, information. And for the second iteration of the, of the project that was going to be presented in Orleans, we did a full-scale version, this time uh, for Estación 16 uh, by Olivia Segan. Uh, Olivia Segan was a French sculptor that lived in Mexico for many years. So for a long time, we were trying to find in Pedro Ramirez Vasquez archives the plans for the structures, and we didn't find any of them. We also tried through the embassy to uh, contact Olivia Segan. Um, no one knew who, where he was living. He kind of moved back to France and stopped working. Um, so it was almost like doing these uh, forensic uh, research, you know, archaeological research, trying to reconstruct the, the structure along with the, the metal workers that were helping us to build the structure. So it was almost like a process in reverse, like reverse engineering through photographs um, that, we, that we did the sculpture. So uh, we were measuring all of these photographs and slowly trying to recreate that moment. And only a few weeks after, before the opening, um, we found out that Olivia Segan was all the time living in Orleans. So it was through a friend of a friend who said, like, Olivia Segan, that sounds familiar. He, there's a guy named Olivia also here. That there's a very old man. He's a sculptor. You should talk to him. Maybe he knows him. It's like, no, it's him. <laughs> so he was very happy that the piece came back uh, by coincidence to, to Orleans and that somehow someone was reinterpreting this moment. And to me, it was really curious when we were talking to him and to Todd Williams that many of the sculptors never even found out about the massacre in Tlatelolco. So there was like this huge staging by the state to actually prevent people from knowing of these disparities that were happening in the public realm. So stripping it down and just like bringing back to Current history was important to me. This is uh, the installation. Um, now it's that the sculpture is permanently installed in the botanical garden of Orleans La Source. Um, this is the moment where we were in just installing it, but the idea is that the grass over here slowly grows and the vines start taking over this ruin in reverse. Um, and well, those are the projects, and I think uh, we can move on to, to the questions now. Thank you so much for your time.
Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very, very much, Frida, for the, your... Uh, can you hear me? No? Hello? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Frida, for your fascinating lecture. Um, we now have an opportunity for questions um, from the audience. Uh, so I'll just open it up to you. We have some roaming mics. And there's one just here. Um, hello? Hi. Hola. Um, I want, first of all, I want to thank you and congratulate you for bringing Mexican architecture back to the world spectrum. Um, and as, as a Mexican architect living here in London, uh, I was very, very pleased to see and experience your pavilion. Um, um, the question is, um, and well, you're, when you were presenting about the the houses, the sorry, the uh, Casa de Servicio, which now Roma brings into question, no, um, it's it's really interesting that here no one would understand that it's long gone and past uh, the the service thing. Uh, it you see it in manor houses, but really old. Um, Thinking of it, how has, is that evolving and how is that really changing in Mexico? That service industry is very present and still part of it and part of how it helps keep that really poor part of society. But how do us architects, can we involve and change and help you know, um, evolve that, that part of Mexico? I think the, the first step is to think about it and to question it and not to assume that that is the normal thing to have. You know, that, that is, to me, the most important part. But then we need to remember that we as architects are only providing like a very, very small piece to the puzzle. We are not here to resolve world problems and definitely not to bring world peace. You know? So to me, what's interesting to see is how um, these dynamics are normalized and blurred into our, our like psyche, you know, like this, we assume that these are the relationships that we need to have and the way we're presenting it is like, well, these people are part of my family. It's like, well, really? I, I don't think so, no, like, they should have their own families and they should have the same rights and they should have the same space that you are able to enjoy. So I think this is a very interesting uh, political moment in Mexico. Some of you may know that uh, there are <laughs> That was an echo of myself. <laughs> uh, it's interesting to see that um, they're actually creating a union now. And some people say that if all these women, because of course it has to do with gender, race, and age, um, they're like getting together. And this would be probably one of the most powerful unions in Mexico. So this could turn into a huge political form. And if we think about that, then we really need to think about the consequences of what the space would be in those terms, because we're thinking now in Mexico also about caretaking. So this is something that the government is taking away, but they're being, they're being recognized as unions, uh, but then the caretaking, they said like, we're, we're taking off a part of the budget from kindergartens and caretaking institutions, because that is something that the family does. So this is something that only the privileged families use. And it's like, I think this is a little bit biased because then you're really uh, relying that the female workforce needs to be unpaid and to remain unpaid. And this is something that is not acceptable anymore. We should be thinking about how to generate more spaces of solidarity, yes, but also for opportunity for every woman. Absolutely. Um, do we, oh, we have another question here. Um, what do you think is your identifiable style and um, is there a recurring element or theme in all your projects? Do you mean um, if I have an identifiable style? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to escape that. So if I'm failing, please remind me that I shouldn't be. <laughs> no, I think um, Pedro Ramirez Vasquez's lesson is valuable in that sense. I mean, the way he used it probably has to do more with power. But I think it has to do with being worried more about the social dynamics behind it rather than the image that we project. So for me, that is an important part that it's not about the object, but the dynamics within the object. So okay, I hope that you. that's the yeah. recognizable thing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Any further questions for Frida? 
Well, I'm, I'm interested in um, the relationship with, with women and, and architecture in, in Mexico, and it's amazing seeing the wealth of, of, of architecture practice in, in Mexico at the moment with so many um, female architects as yourself uh, running practices. To, uh, Frida Escobedo, Tatiana Balda, uh, Balbao, um, and many, many others. And where do you think that... Um, empowerment comes from, um, especially in relation to um, the, the services project you were referencing? I think to me it was really important to see Tatiana Bilbao build her practice. Before her, really, like there were no female led offices um, well, or only female led offices. Of course, there are many brilliant architects, but they're always in partnership with. Uh, male counterpart. So that was not recognized. And I think that's also problematic because when you think about it, it's like, well, it's half the, the partnership in a way. So, but Tatiana really pushed the boundary and gave us the next generation's confidence to think about other things. She's also working a lot um, about um, social housing, for example, and the way that the territory is organized in that way. Um, so I think it's a different perspective. We, what I've been seeing, and I, I think it's a coincidence, the change of times, no? but I think we're not worried about like making bigger and more square meters, uh, but more about like the networking and the structures. And it's, I think it's a different set of interests. No, absolutely. Any more, oh, there's a question here. Hello. Um, Seeing all this in temporary interventions like the Lisbon one or the Serpentine Pavilion, um, do you ever consider that they should stay there like forever? For example, the New Orleans now, you are, you are talking about the, the grass to take over it. And when I was looking at the Lisbon one as a Portuguese architect, originally that, the, that plaza, that square was not exactly empty. There was a, there was a market there since the beginning of the city until the 19th century. And afterwards, uh, somewhere along the 20th century, they completely demolished everything to transform more or less where, where it is now, the, the square. And that small interventions there, that actually it's part of the um, revival of the memory of the city. I'm not, I'm focused on this, that one because I can identify relate right away with that. But every single time that there is a temporary intervention, sometimes on the city, in some way they should be permanent. Do you ever think that the temporary interventions um, that you are creating, sometimes they should uh, stay there <coughs> at the intern? And if that's so, do you ever try to negotiate with the local authorities to do that? I think this is a very important question in terms of architecture because what, what is permanence in a way? Like how, how long are we looking at it? No? Like if you think about the history of humankind, then nothing is permanent. Everything has been like very fleeting and you know, like it evaporates very quickly because our lifetime is really, really short. So I don't know if creating more permanence would be a solution, but I'm also interested in the idea of not generating, uh, you know, like cheap luxury or things that actually create waste. That is a different condition. No, I'm, I'm, I'm pro doing temporary things if they can remain as things, uh, you know, in the mind of people because they remind them of their culture and they actually add a little bit to that layer rather than creating something that creates profit for some other people. So I think there's a difference between permanence and being sustainable, no, or responsible, because I don't like to use the word sustainable anymore. I think it's just about responsibility. And the, probably the, the most responsible thing to do would be to create something that is flexible enough for it to evolve the way it needs, so it can remain longer. No, It's like being something that bends easily with the wind rather than trying to be very static, because that, of course, would be more obsolete very fast, especially now. No? Okay, one last question here. So just touching upon that and the layers of buildings and history and what's your your take on heritage then? What, what about, I mean, it, we need to conserve it, but you're talking about also we need to move on and it's not permanent. So how important is heritage and conservation of historical buildings? 
I mean, of course, there are different timings, but I, I think it, you can compare it a little bit with what is culture and food. No, when you think about food, it's something that is deeply, deeply embedded in our systems, in the, no, in the culture, and it becomes really personal, and it's about memory and affection and like this effect that it has uh, in you. Uh, but it's, again, like it's something that is quickly evolving and it changes from one generation to the next. So I think it's just a matter of understanding different temporalities. It's not just, like what would be permanent in a building? 200 years, a thousand years? This is the last one, <laughs> just in the middle. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, just a very quick question. You made some very beautiful readings about how culture can be read through architecture and analyzed from making very careful readings. And I really loved how you talked about the relationship with a client of a single family house. Um, you're writing a letter almost. And I wondered whether you kind of ended that with um, the sense that a public space, you almost have to wait and see what happens. And I was curious to ha what extent do you see architects um, having a role or an opportunity to improve this relationship and perhaps we can start a more active conversation with the public. I think it's, it's a very important question right now because the way we engage with the public is very different and to me it has been a challenge. I'm in this generation that is in between, you know, technology and being like pencil and paper, <laughs> more pencil and paper than technology to be honest. So the way people are experiencing public space is very different for me and I trust a lot in my team, you know, like to, to have that kind of um, knowledge and, and to continue to uh, observe it and to be curious about it but it's I think it's all about observation and also like keeping the eyes open and it's gonna sound like really corny but also the heart open you know like you need to really be empathetic with the others and to try to understand it otherwise like how can you design for some for someone that you feel is different from you you need to understand the basic things that you have in common and therefore you can start playing with that no? and also like just being open to change like what you plan is not necessary what you are going to get. Sometimes you will get better results if you're lucky. Um, on that note, please join me in thanking Frida for uh, this evening, for the talk. Thank you very much.